Welcome to week four of the Courageous Simplicity Bible Study. We hope you are being stretched and blessed by spending time in God's Word. This week, we're taking a closer look at how becoming a woman of courageous simplicity means understanding where our true significance comes from. And one of the key themes of the study has been that we aren't enough because of what we do, but because of what Jesus has done for us. But in order to believe this and to live it out, we have to stop operating out of self-reliance and move into this posture of God-reliance. And so the Apostle Paul, he talks about this idea of boasting in our weaknesses, which seems almost like a paradox. Mm -hmm. So Grace, for you, what does that look like? You know, I grew up um, learning that I can only rely on myself. So as I matured in my faith, it was really hard to shift from only trusting me to know that I can actually trust God and trust others. And so it looked, it's looked like humility um, to know that I can and to surrender myself to trusting the Lord. And it's also, it's also made me realize that God doesn't disdain our weakness. He actually relishes in it so that He can show His power. Well, this week in the study, I share a story about how um, I was crushed when I didn't get into the college of my dreams. And really it's a story about how I found my worth and my significance in my achievements, in the world's applause. And when that was taken away, I was like, who am I? Um, but what I learned and what I'm continuing to learn is that often the world's rejection is part of God's invitation to us to find our identity in him. Um, so I don't, uh, it's not comfortable to boast in my weakness, but what I'm finding is, is that guess what? God's word is true and that his power is made perfect in our weakness. And when I realize like I can't measure up on my own, then God's strength is available to work in me. You're so right, Becky. It's not comfortable at all to admit our weaknesses. I don't think we're trained to do that. Yeah. But I have found that when I'm willing to share my weakness or name my weakness to the Lord, that it actually is this invitation for Him mm -hmm. to come in. Mm -hmm. And I think about in John 14, it talks about the Holy Spirit and that God gifts us the Holy Spirit as our guide, as our teacher, as our helper, as our comfort. So I just think about him as being those things that he's coming alongside me. And so I am learning to name my weakness and invite him to come to that space. Learning we are enough in Christ is not only about not relying on ourselves, but also recognizing that God is at work in the small moments of our lives. And that's countercultural to how the world thinks. So for you guys, how are you learning to find your purpose and identity in Christ rather than the world's validation? I think for me, it just means to cease striving and to remind myself of what it says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, that I'm a new creation. Mm -hmm. I've chosen to believe in Jesus and then I'm new. And so it's not about the things that I've achieved in the past or the things that I'm going to do in the future, but that I'm actually new in him and that I could just bask in that truth. And that's where I can find my self-worth and my validation. Oh, that's good. Um, I think for me, I'm coming to see that I'm not going to find my purpose one day when I accomplish X, Y, Z. It's that mm -hmm. someday mentality that we talked about all the way back in week one. It can filter into feeling like I have purpose. Like one day when I do this, then I will have arrived. But like you're saying, it's those small moments to realize that I have purpose right where I am today, whether I am helping my kids with school or I'm working on a work project or meeting a friend for coffee, that if God is with me right there, then I have purpose because I just get to listen to his voice, hopefully obey what he's asking me to do and walk with him. I love that, Becky. Um, and I wrote a story in this week's study about having to do um, a daily chore, uh, sweeping our backyard. And it's not something that I can get done ahead of time. It's something that I have to do daily. And one of the things I, I learned in, in the practice of doing my chores, it sounds so childish, but um, was to see that God is there in the mundane. Um, and also to recognize that we don't have to do things in order to live on purpose. So um, one thing that has been so humbling for me is to recognize those of us who struggle with mental illness or a physical disability and how 
we can't say that those of us who can't actually do something mm -hmm. uh, means that we're not living on purpose. Mm -hmm. That's not true. We can live on purpose even if we're not doing something, even if we're bedridden in our homes, as long as we are becoming more like Christ. Mm -hmm. And that is enough for us. It's enough because he's enough. And this whole conversation about being enough really points back to the reality of God's love and sacrifice. Um, and I feel like that our questions and doubts about our own enoughness are really supposed to be like arrows pointing us back to the reality of God's grace in our life. And so I'd love to hear what does God's grace in your everyday gritty life look like for you? I don't know if you guys grew up thinking of God this way, but I always saw him as stern, and maybe this is just a reflection of my own my own parents, but I saw him as maybe mean or always disappointed in me. Um, and so his grace to me has felt like kindness, actually, mm -hmm. and gentleness, and knowing that um, he's not going to look away because I'm weak or because I've made mistakes or mm -hmm. I can't get myself up by myself, and that his grace can look like pruning, taking away so that I can find rest. What about you? I think for me, just realizing that God's grace is really in his forgiveness of my past. I'm not held by the things that I did in the past that I you know, would normally be ashamed of. I don't have to feel guilty of, about those things mm -hmm. um, because I can walk in his grace. And there's this freedom in that that I don't have to be imprisoned or chained to those things anymore. And so for me also, it means stepping forward into this place of flourishing. I believe that God designed every one of us to flourish, even if we're in trials, that there is a place of flourishing that he has for us. God's grace in my life is the constant reminder that I don't have to earn his love or approval. And he also gently reminds me that I don't have to hold my life all together. I actually kind of like Instagram filters because I like things to look polished and shiny and I wanna be able to hold all the things and have limitless capacity, but that's not reality. Like we are human and God's grace is saying like, Becky, I will hold all things together. I will hold you and you can actually even fall apart and it's not gonna change how I love you. You can be anxious, it's not gonna change how I love you. And he just gently pulls me back to the center of who he is and I can just, I can just be there. I feel like the more time that we spend with God, the more we realize how desperately we need him. Yes. And then we keep returning to him because we understand that kind of desperation. So God is pouring out his love and grace in our lives. Um, but we also have to reckon with the fact that there is an enemy of our souls who is trying to lie to us, who is trying to undermine God's voice. And so that brings me to this question that I've been thinking about is, what does that look like for you? Has shame tried to silence or quiet the voice of God in your lives? Yes. <laughs> yes. And actually this week I share a story about how I was in fact in church and the enemy kind of out of the blue brought up these memories from deep in my past and just blanketed me with shame and made me question like, why am I even here? I should just go home. I couldn't connect with the people around me. I couldn't authentically worship God in that moment. And it actually wasn't just a one-time thing. It was this trigger that over and over, week after week, I battled this shame. And what I had to remember, like you were saying earlier, is that like God's taking care of it. <laughs> Mm -hmm. He, we have already dealt with that. There's a difference between God's loving rebuke and asking us to turn from sin, mm -hmm. which I had already done and the enemy coming in and twisting truths, mm -hmm. um, and trying to shackle us back into that place of, of guilt that is no longer ours mm -hmm. to carry. You're right. I think shame can, can have the power to grow exponentially and what might be a small part of our history or our past or even our current time it can blow up to become the whole of our identity. And so it feels as though we're being swallowed by shame. Um, but it, so it takes courage. It takes courage to look it in the eye, um, to recognize it for what it is, and to shrink it back to the right size, taking our thoughts captive in Christ, and then remembering that, like what you said, Christ already died for that. And so we don't need to carry that shame with us. And sometimes courage means inviting someone else 
into that struggle with us. I, I talk about how even on my own after praying and trying to call out the truth, like you're saying, I was still just burdened by these past memories. And I, it was hard and embarrassing, but I told a friend, I was like, here's what's happening. Like on Sunday mornings, like, will you pray for me? And inviting someone else in can be scary, but we also can know that we're not alone. So shame tries to isolate us. And I think what you did was so important because you invited your friend in. Mm -hmm. You said, I'm not going to sit here isolated and by myself with these memories that are attacking me. I'm going to invite my friend in who can give me accountability. Maybe it's encouragement. And then you have this community that's fighting back with you. Yeah. And I love how the Apostle Paul talks about in Philippians 3, 13 through 14, this idea of forgetting what's in the past and pursuing what is in front of us. Yeah. So the reality is there are times when those memories are going to come up. We can't sure. completely erase all of that, yeah. but it's this pursuit. It's this pivoting. I'm going to face forward and I am going to chase after what God has for me. And I'm not going to let these thoughts control me and isolate me really into that place of shame. As we continue to reflect on this week's study and how we can live in the enoughness of God's grace, let's remember what happens to our sin when we have been forgiven and why it no longer holds us captive. We're gonna to close today by reading together from Psalm 103. Feel free to close your eyes and just take in these words or follow along in your Bible. Psalm 103, let all that I am praise the Lord. With my whole heart, I will praise His holy name. Let all that I am praise the Lord. May I never forget the good things He does for me. He forgives all my sins and heals all my diseases. He redeems me from death and crowns me with love and tender mercies. He fills my life with good things. My youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the people of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his faithful love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. We pray that today you soak in the assurance that you are enough because you are loved by God. Let's continue to become women of courageous simplicity who live free, forgiven, and focused on Jesus.